Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amy West. If we haven't yet met, I am uh, recording a lecture for Christina's class today from my backyard, as you see. So um, it is a little windy today, but I'm using headphones and I did a test run. So I think it'll be okay. I just kind of wanted to be outside since now we can, now that spring is here. Um, also, maybe it'll be more interesting to listen to a lecture with some of the outdoor noises as well. So um, you might hear wind blowing, but I, I don't think it should interfere with the sound or anything. Just use it as an opportunity to experience nature, perhaps. And yeah, you'll have to ignore me if my hair is flying around. Um, I'll move inside if I need to, but we'll, we'll stay out here for a little bit. So um, yes, my name is Amy West. I'm a faculty member at UNO. I teach um, quite a few classes. As an instructor, I teach four classes. So I teach primarily at the undergrad level. If you've been in our undergrad program the last few years, you've definitely had me, um, although I think y'all are foundation students, so you haven't been. Um, you might have me in a future class as well if you, again, if you haven't yet already. Or I teach statistics, so if you have to take statistics at any time, um, you'll, you'll probably have me for that. So I'm here today to talk about macro social work. Um, this is a huge passion of mine. This PowerPoint that I'm going to go over today is actually a presentation. It's a modified presentation, um, and I'll probably skip certain parts of it. It's a modified presentation from the NASW uh, Nebraska Chapters Conference last year. I, I did like a macro type workshop there. Um, and I've also used a lot of this content to influence one of the macro level, one of the master's level macro level classes that I teach, which is um, currently known as social welfare planning. Soon the name will be changed to planning for social change. I have um, so I've long been a social worker who's interested in the more macro side of things. I come from child welfare primarily, so I, I do have quite a bit of experience in um, micro level areas, specifically children and family stuff. Although my interest and my passion always laid with um, some of the bigger picture types of changes that I wanted to see for the foster care system, that I wanted to see for children, um, and, and now that I want to see for all of us. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about today um, might be things that have come up in conversations before. Some of it might be new information. I, I hope that some of it's new information. Um, I really am, am feeling from my studies and, and just my continued emphasis on macro level stuff um, that we're sort of at a, a critical turning point for the social work profession. Um, to me, I'm, I'm seeing more opportunities than ever to to sort of have us as social workers take a step back and um, look at the work we're doing and, and think about, is this the best way that we can do this type of work? Um, yeah, some critical questions that I'll go over in this presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna try not to step on my toes. My dog is also outside with us too. So let me see if I can show you. Uh, I don't know if you can see him, it's really dark on the thing, but. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> so he's outside with me too. So um, if he barks or runs around or anything, that's what's going on. So we'll see how this outdoor class goes. <laughs> okay. So uh, obviously we can't do introductions because I'm not there with you in person, unfortunately. But I do want to encourage you as we sort of dig into this content. Um, let me move this guy too. It's probably annoying. Oh, there I go too. So I want to encourage you as we start getting into this content to, to think about how do you identify and how have you identified? Um, even if you're new to social work, something brought you to this point, right? So some sort of interest, some sort of passion, you realized you wanted to help people in some sort of format. Um, how have you identified that part of yourself up until now? Do you also kind of have this inkling towards the more macro side of things where you want to see bigger picture change, longer term change, social change, social justice, etc. Um, or even those one of the interactions that really kind of like fill your cup and, and bring you joy and, and are, are what you want to bring to this profession. Um, how do you feel like you balance those? So of course, one of the things with social work is that um, we pull from all of this, right? We pull from all of this. So even myself as somebody who, who certainly identifies as more macro, I use micro skills all the time. 
Um, so yeah, I would just encourage you to, to take a pause and, and think about how do you see that happening in your own life? Um, where do you think your mindset currently is? And perhaps you don't even know enough about macro social work to have a decision at this point in time, which is fine too. Perhaps after this uh, presentation, you'll have one. Uh, so I want to lead into that with uh, a recognition that when we talk about macro social work, my goodness, things seem to get confusing very quickly. And I, um, so this isn't a new problem. This isn't a new challenge with social work. This is something that our profession has grappled with for a really long time. Uh, if you have read Mark Courtney's book, what is it called? Um, Fallen Angels, how social workers have lost their mission or something like that. Social work has lost its mission. So there has been a recognition. That book was put out in the 80s, and it was essentially talking about uh, the move towards clinical. So social work as a profession, the move towards towards clinical work instead of more of this like community organizing, uh, settler movement type foundation that, that social work was framed, at least within the United States. So this conversation of how does macro social work fit in when we kind of do have a, a prominent clinical focus in our field. There are a lot of y'all who probably want to get out there and be therapists. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, it does bring in an element of confusion though, because then how do we incorporate that macro side of our profession? How are we ensuring that uh, we're not just replicating systems of oppression and, and teaching people how to fit within those systems? How do we know if we're actually making bigger picture sustainable change too? So when we talk about um, what does that even mean? Again, the, the definitions get really blurry. So what I did was, um, I pulled out a few definitions, sort of definitions, of what macro social work is uh, identified as from a variety of sources. So let's just kind of read over these together. So here's a pretty basic slide. You've probably seen this, um, just like a generic intro to social work thing that I pulled off the internet. So it's talking about levels of social work practice, talking about micro, meso talks about macro social work as involving working with organizations or communities to improve or change laws or policies in general society. <laughs> in general society, I guess. So uh, yeah, kind of vague, not super detailed, indicates there's some sort of like collaboration happening with organizations and communities. Um, there's a focus on laws and policies. Okay. So here's another definition. This is from actually the NASW, as you can see in the corner there, it's from the NASW Code of Ethics from 2018, although they also, yeah, they pulled these definitions from the 2015 edition of Social Work Speaks as well. So our profession, NASW, uh, identifies macro practice as social work practice that is aimed at bringing about improvements and changes in the general society. There we have general society again, and it talks about some of the different types of, of ways that we might do this. Again, really vague. How do we bring about improvement and change? Um, even when we think about that on a micro level, how do we bring about improvement and change in someone's life? Um, easier to say than to do, right? So here's this. Let me move myself over. Woo! <laughs> uh, so here's another definition from an actual macro practice textbook. Uh, defines macro practice as professionally guided intervention designed to bring about change in organizational, community, and policy arenas. Okay, same sort of thing we're seeing. Uh, this one's my favorite. <laughs> this is from an older social work textbook, macro textbook, but um, yeah, this is my favorite. So this book starts out their section on talking about macro social work practice with, what is macro social work practice? You will grapple with this question not only as you read this book, but also throughout your career as a professional social worker. Uh, and then it goes on to say, indeed, practitioners and educators often differ when asked to define macro social work practice. So even if you have had some of these conversations in your classes thus far, um, you've probably encountered some of the things that we've already seen. Vague terminology, um, sort of, yeah, super general definitions, mentioning here's these different components of macro social work, macro social workers focus on policy, law, um, but not really how do we then integrate that into our work as a social worker <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if we don't choose to take on a position where we're working directly with policy and laws. 
Um, <clears throat> you probably have also seen that your, your instructors talk about macro practice differently. That's why at the beginning of this presentation, whatever, um, I mentioned that uh, might be new, might be new to think about, might be new for you to hear about. Um, a lot of this is like ongoing conversation that's happening within the social work profession too. So even at a national level, we're recognizing, oh, we kind of have this problem of like, we don't even know how to define this sort of core aspect of our profession. Uh oh. Uh, oftentimes we are taught that macro skills, sort of similar to clinical skills too, but it's like tools in a toolbox, right? And we, we come together and we bring all these skills and um, macro social work includes evaluation and fundraising and policy work and grant writing and communities and systems and legislation and da 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 da. Um, so we can also hear people talk about and define macro practice in, in this sort of way as like a set of skills and then here are the skills that you use to do the work that you're doing. Great, skills are, are valid and important to have. Um, but still kind of like leaves it up to us to figure out how do we actually integrate this? How do we actually incorporate this into our practice? And again, if I'm not being paid specifically to do these particular roles, um, then what does that mean? I guess it means I'm not a macro social worker. Okay, so here are a couple articles that I actually did like. Uh, these are articles that I've now included as, as uh, required reading for the macro class that I taught that I teach that I mentioned. So this one is a newer article from 2017 by a social worker out of Maryland, Baltimore. He has this article why macro practice matters. It says macro practice or macro social work practice pushes the boundaries of the profession by fostering a big picture perspective that analyzes people's issues outside the box and focuses on the prevention of problems, not merely their amelioration. So amelioration is a big word. I um, I spent a few years working at Nebraska Appleseed, so I learned to talk a little bit of lawyer, learned to speak lawyer a little bit. Uh, ameliorate means like to get rid of. So to ameliorate something means like you're, you're getting rid of the problem. So if someone is poor and I give them $5,000, um, perhaps I've ameliorated their current problem of poverty. Of course, I've, I've changed nothing in their broader situation of how they ended up in poverty in the first place. And after they spend that $5,000, then who knows if the problem will continue to be ameliorated, right? So that's where this focus on prevention comes into play. So this is one of the first articles that I came across that talked about uh, macro social work as a perspective instead of like a thing that we're doing. So instead of macro social work is when you email your senator and say, hey, please support this policy, this article is, is bringing to light uh, macro social work is actually a way that we think. It's a way of thinking differently about social problems, regardless of what level we're in, so that we can do the best good that, that we want to do for people. So here's another one from that book before. Um, let's see, do I want to even talk about this? Indeed, many social workers would argue that is the macro level, the attention given by social workers to the big social issues of importance to consumers that distinguishes social work from other helping professions. Yes, okay, um, this is good, this is important, sorry. It's been a few months since I've did this presentation. So, um, yes, the, the thing that makes our profession different from something like counseling or any of the other types of like therapeutic practices is that we have this focus on macro practice. Um, so this was something that really resonated with me when I was thinking about how can we better define macro because um, it's true, right? Like we, we enter the social work profession because we want to look at client situations. We want to look at people's problems from a systems perspective. We want to understand on an individual level what's going on for them, what do they need. But we also want to look at how does their environment impact where they're at? How does the society impact where they're at? Um, how do laws and policies impact where they're at? How does our family, et cetera? We want to take this sort of systems perspective. So I... Um, this also resonated in terms of, for me, thinking about macro social work as less of a thing that we're doing, less of an action that we're taking, and more of a perspective that we're holding. Because really, as social workers, that's what we're called to do. That's what we're um, sort of taught to do, although barriers get in the way to that. So hence, let me move myself again. 
Woohoo! <laughs> um, so hence, I am proposing a, a serious way of demystifying this this chaotic, confusing, um, nebulous thing we call macro practice. Instead of trying to figure out what it looks like, um, what if we considered it as an additional perspective to have? So what if we thought it what what if we thought about macro practice sort of like we do about clinical practice in terms of um, it, it changes the way that we think about everything. So you're probably finding that in your social work classes now that you're learning things that are changing your perspective. They're changing the way that you see people who are who are experiencing problems. Um, either people who are victims of circumstance or even people who are perpetuators of, of something, perpetuators of violence, of perpetuators of sexual assault. A social work perspective calls on us to look at those people from a human perspective, really, to, to think about, to not write them off as good or bad, if that's a bad person, that's a felon, that's a sex offender, whatever, um, but to instead think about how that came to be and how they are being set up to be in the position that they're in. So we do this naturally in a lot of ways. Um, and I believe that we could get uh, an immense benefit as a profession out of uh, learning to shift our perspectives to adhere with this macro perspective in addition to some of the micro perspectives that we hold. So I have three simple steps to uh, encourage you to start thinking about this, to think about how you could adopt a macro perspective in your everyday life. So I'm going to talk about, this is what um, the rest of this presentation is going to be. I'm going to talk about these three simple steps and lay out some details, lay out some examples, um, ask you to reflect and think about a few things. And yeah, we'll just see what comes up. So first step, liberating your worldview. Uh, so this mug is a social construct, which is a, a joke, but it's also true. So um, it is really easy in this life to believe the things that, that we're shown growing up, right? Like that's what, um, that's what culture does, that's what society does, that's what social norms do. They teach us how to think. And we don't even oftentimes know that, they're, that they have taught us how to think or that they are shaping how we think. But if we can imagine um, by accident of birth, we are here in this body, in this life, in this time period, in this place. Um, by accident of birth, you happen to be perhaps born in Nebraska or Omaha or wherever. Um, just as easily, you could have been born in an entirely different country with an entirely different culture, and this mug might hold a different significance, might hold a different meaning. So liberating our worldview is um, practicing because it's not, it's not something that comes natural to us, but it is the step of practicing to try and take off the, um, the, the social cultural lens that you have been sort of indoctrinated with. To be able to step back and, and work towards um, viewing the circumstance, viewing the situation around you from a little bit more objectivity, just so that you're able to recognize. So you're able to recognize like, oh, this is a social construct I'm holding. Um, doesn't mean that it's bad, doesn't mean that it's wrong. Like mugs are great. I have a slightly different kind of mug right here. Um, so there's nothing wrong with us having socially constructed this concept of like this circular whatever device is used to hold coffee right now for me at least. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a bad thing by any means. However, by recognizing that that this could be anything in any other culture, or I could use it as a variety of, th of different things if I needed to now, um, it allows me to, to step back a little bit and expand my vision, expand my worldview, so I'm not just stuck within my own perspective. Okay, so let's think about a couple more examples of that. Uh, this is a book that I really enjoy. It's by Robert Sapolsky, you can kind of see. I'll scoot myself over a little bit more. Uh, this is by Robert Sapolsky. He also wrote the book, uh, Why Zebras Don't Have Ulcers. So if you're familiar with that, or if you're not, um, he also wrote that book. It's kind of an interesting take. So he focuses on biology and he has focused most of his efforts on animals, the animal kingdom, 
but use that then as a way of learning about humans and human behavior. So he's really sort of um, practiced this liberation of worldview by looking at animal behavior and identifying the similarities that we as humans have in common with them, even though in this society we're, we're raised to see ourselves as very different from animals and like, yeah, somehow we are polar opposites and the animals are over there and we're over here and, and we're unconnected, which in reality, if you zoom out, it doesn't really make sense. So one of the quotes in this book that, that really resonated for me was this one. So I'll just read it for you. Putting facts into nice putting facts into nice, cleanly demarcated buckets of explanation has its advantages. For example, it can help you remember facts better, but it can wreak havoc on your ability to think about those facts. This is because the boundaries between different categories are often arbitrary. But once some arbitrary boundary exists, we forget that it is arbitrary and get way too impressed with its importance. So this really resonated for me when I'm thinking about what a social construct is. Um, and I will have some examples for you of that, I think, on the next couple of slides. But what I like about it is, uh, so language is a tool. Language is a tool. Language is how we communicate with one another. A great gift, a great ability to be able to have. Uh, language has allowed us to do tons and tons and tons of things that otherwise humans wouldn't have been able to do. Language can also be a barrier. When we have words for things, when we have categories for things, like this text says, if you think about it, um, we ultimately fall, we can fall victim of um, viewing the label itself as the thing and forgetting that the label is representing something much more complex underneath. Okay, that's kind of a lot, so let me explain what I mean. Um, so what colors are these? What colors do you see on the screen? Hopefully your colors look similar to my colors because actually when I did this at the conference, it totally flopped because the projector made the colors look weird. So hopefully you're thinking like orange and blue. <laughs> How about now? They're similar. Hopefully you're still thinking orange and blue. If you're not, I'll show you. Here's blue. <laughs> um, but there's different shades of blue, right? So if I was saying, if I was talking about the color blue, I'm using one small word, one label, but I could be talking about a whole different kind of, um, all kinds of different shades of blue. So cayenne, navy, both of those technically fall under this category of blue. Same thing with orange. There's all kinds of different colors of orange. There's this official orange color, goldenrod, pumpkin, all kinds of things. Um, hold on to the laptop. So my house is kind of orange even, but it's a different shade than even the visions that we see on the screen ahead of us. So again, it's, it's helpful to have language. It's helpful to be able to say like, oh, I live in the orange house down the way. Um, <clears throat> however, if somebody had this very specific image of like, okay, so orange then is just this color, if my house is goldenrod, then they might not understand that I was talking about the same text. So words are helpful in labeling things. They can also um, limit our ability to think about what those things are. So one example that I really like is, is gender, right? And, and we're seeing more and more awareness spread about um, the fact that gender is a social construct many social constructs, race as well. Um, gender is certainly a social construct. So similarly, when I say the word orange and you have this idea in your head of what the color orange is, when in reality it can be all kinds of different shades, hundreds, perhaps thousands of different, slightly different shades of orange. So in reality, a col the color orange is, is a really complex thing, even though when I'm just saying it to you, um, it comes off as very simplified similar thing with gender. When we say man versus woman, we're using one tiny word to encompass every person that we would put in like the, the man or masculine category and every single person we would put in the woman or feminine category. So um, gender is a really good example of how we are slowly as a society working towards liberating our viewpoint and getting away from the labels that have been created to describe human behavior and instead recognizing the complexity that's underneath the surface of those labels. Um, this is somebody that I follow on Instagram, a uh, fabulous person, Jacob Tobiah. So they have this um, 
yeah, they've been in a number of, of publications lately. They are very connected to the fashion world and very outspoken about um, this evolution of gender that we're seeing. So this was in, like a last year presentation that they were doing on Fifty Shades of Gender. So um, literally there are ongoing comparisons of gender to color, just like blue represents tons of different shades man, woman, non-binary, whatever, represents tons of different shades. Um, we're not the same, and, and we know this, but again, when we try and categorize ourselves with one tiny label, sometimes we forget that. Okay, um, yeah, I didn't include race on there, but race is another great example of a social construct that we've given way too much importance to over time. Um, in fact, race as a concept was developed specifically to um, sort of divide us as a human population in order to use race as justification for dehumanization. So race itself in the United States, if you, if you research it, if you go back and, and do some reading of the, the origin of this thing we call race in, in the United States, um, it was specifically employed for the purpose of, of things like eugenics, the eugenics movement, um, things to prove that people with darker skin color, to prove that people with darker skin color had less intelligence, less whatever, humanity, less um, worth as a person in order to justify things like slavery. However, over time, we've, we've moved past some of that, but we've still stayed attached to this label that was created arbitrarily in the first place, when in reality, what, what we know through science is that uh, race is, is such a small difference. It's like the difference between me and someone with blonde hair, same thing with, with skin tone. We just have, as a society, um, placed so much emphasis on it and unfortunately used it as a tool of oppression for so long that it's taken on an entirely different meaning in, in the United States in particular, but certainly other areas of the world that's has spread as well. So, um, yes, lots of ways that we can think about social constructs for sure. Okay, next part of this Liberate Your Worldview piece that I want to talk about is, uh, perhaps you figured it out from the very creative image I have on the screen, uh, but zooming out, zooming out, zooming out, so important, so difficult to do, but so important. Uh, and, and we know this and we think about this on, again, a, a micro level, but it can be a bit more difficult to, to conceptualize on a macro level. So on a micro level, perhaps you've heard the saying that's, that's on the slide now, healing is not linear. So if you have done any kind of um, trauma healing work yourself, if you're engaged with the mental health community much, you've probably hopefully heard this, heard the saying. It, it's really uh, resonated and been helpful for a lot of people who are working to heal from serious trauma, serious oppression, etc. cetera, um, because it's a reminder that a bad day doesn't mean my life is falling apart. If I can't get out of bed one day, doesn't mean that it's over, I should give up, I just am always going to be depressed. Healing is not linear, so I can still be moving with upward momentum, even if I have a bad day, or even if I have a period of time where I don't feel good at all, um, even if I struggle with a bout of depression for a few months. It doesn't mean that I'm not healing, it doesn't mean that I'm not getting better, it doesn't mean that I'm not progressing and growing. Um, it just means that, that there's no simple linear path from point A to point B for something as complex as, as human development. So another image, let's talk about progress, what people think it looks like. We think that it's a super straight path from point A to point B. I'm just going to decide to go to therapy and then I'll be totally fine in a month. Um, not true. Anyone who's been to therapy can tell you. Woo! Not true. Okay, the neighbor dogs are out. If there's one of the neighbor dogs that really does not like our dog. Um, so if there's vicious barking, I will pause and we can reconvene. Okay, yeah, let's pause and reconvene. Okay, we're back. Um, yeah, I decided to move inside. Um, the dogs were not happy. I was out there recording how dare I so <laughs> it's a little bit more quiet in here um, at least you can still see some lovely trees so and my hair won't be blowing all over the place so um, yeah let's pick back up so yes 
thinking about progress, thinking about how progress looks, thinking about um, what expectations we hold for how progress looks. So on an individual level, we are getting better at doing this. It's not always easy, um, especially I think when we think about ourselves and the expectations we hold for ourselves. Um, when we expect perfection from ourselves, we are expecting this like straight line pathway from point A to point B. Uh, when we're being more realistic, we recognize that life is more like a giant squiggle and there are times when we're up and down and all over the place. Uh, but again, if we zoom out, if we look at things from a broader trajectory, we can see that there is improvement. We can see that um, things are getting better for us, are getting different, are getting closer to the type of um, life that we want, even if it's not where we want it to be right now. Certainly as, as students, I imagine you can probably relate to that. So this is really, really, really important and, and not something that I think we do nearly often enough um, when we talk about macro practice. So if we focus on how things feel today, it feels devastating. It feels overwhelming. Um, it is so easy to look around and see all the wrong that it, it, that is in the world, all the wrong that is in our societies, all the wrong that is in our communities, um, how many people are being hurt by some of the bigger picture issues that are happening in, in this lifetime. When we can zoom out, we can get a better and more accurate picture of where we've come from and therefore where we're ultimately going. So this is representing slavery and segregation. Um, this is a graphic that I really like. I use this a lot in, in the classes that I teach when we talk about this topic um, because it offers a really good visual example of, holy crap, look how far, look how bad things were for so long. And then look at the stuff we're coming out of on the other side. So the red is the length of time of slavery in this country. Yellow, length of time of segregation in this country. If we think about the fact that we've only had since 1954 to truly through legal avenues work towards abolishing the damage that was done with slavery and um, as I mentioned before like the intentional dehumanization of people based on skin color we are just coming out of that age right like 2000 a little bit longer ago now than it was when this was created but it's not that long ago um, and and 2000 was like certainly not that long not that long after 1954. So when we think about the progress that's being made in this country, um, it's easy to feel like nothing is happening when really what's happening is we are slowly, slowly, slowly climbing towards progress, just like we do on an individual level. Only when it happens on a systemic level, it takes a lot more time um, because social situations, societies, communities, much more difficult to change than one person. <clears throat> so let's think about this too. So here is a graphic description of uh, the prison population in the United States, which is something that we have heard a lot, a lot, a lot about, learned so much more about than we ever have over the past several years, thanks to documentaries, thanks to books. Um, this is from the Sentencing Project. Of course, The New Jim Crow is a fantastic book. The documentary 13th is a fantastic film. If you um, not seeing that you you need to very important for our time. So again, when we look at an image like this, super easy to get disheartened. Super easy to look at. Wow, uh, look how bad things have gotten. Look at the point that that we are. Um, how can we ever overcome this? If we look at progress, though, if we consider like this time when we saw there to be a lull and then this increase in prison rates, that was not coincidental, um, aligns with segregation, ending segregation. The, the book, The New Jim Crow, is all about how um, the criminal justice system is the new legalized segregation. So segregation legally ended in 1954. 1954 on this chart is a little bit early, but um, of course, when a law is changed, it takes several years for the effects of that to actually be felt. Again, progress is not linear, right? It's all over, up and down on all the levels, individually, macro. Um, but we see this uptick in the prison population in the 80s um, through the 90s. 
that was not coincidental. That was a direct result of the move away from segregation and continuing efforts to um, really continue to use race as a weapon, right? Really continue to use race as a weapon. So disturbing to look at. If we look at our more recent past, if we think about where have we come just in the last 10 years, we can see that there is a downward trend. And Oh, I don't know what year 13th came out, but it was about this time. It was during um, the heart of the, I don't want to say the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement, but it was when things were really gearing up for the Black Lives Matter movement. The documentary 13th came out, the new Jim Crow had come out a bit before that. There was lots of other uh, efforts to raise national awareness about the problematic use of incarceration as a, a population control method. So if we were able to add on 2017 and 2018 to this image, I would imagine we would continue to see that trend going down. So in times when we feel like, wow, this is insurmountable, things have gotten so bad, how will it ever change? Um, we want to zoom out to the bigger picture and understand, like, why is this happening in the first place? Oh, this is a backlash to the end of segregation. This is a backlash to the legal end of segregation. Progress is not linear. We can't just, on a, a policy macro level, we can't just end something and then suddenly it's over. We still have years, decades, centuries of um, deprogramming, unlearning of the, the um, problematic perspectives and policies that, well, the justification for the policies, right? Like the, the socialization aspect is, is what we're still unlearning. So it's really easy to, to see something like this and feel like this is insurmountable if we can break it off into uh, a chunk and recognize like yes things got really bad things are really bad um much like sometimes people have to hit rock bottom societies sometimes have to hit rock bottom too to realize and accept that a change is needed um, and then we can chunk it off a little bit and see there is some progress small progress my gosh we have a long ways to go um but maybe it's not as hopeful maybe it's not as insurmountable maybe it's not impossible um like perhaps it seemed when we were just looking at this uh, another thing that i love to talk about at this point in time too is just the the changes on a national level in terms of what politics is looking like so this is a presentation i did yeah, last year, earlier last year, so well before just this more recent election. Um, so this is, the images that you're seeing here are, are they? I guess it includes 2017, but I don't believe, oh, it's been a while since I pulled this, but I don't believe that this includes, no, this wouldn't include the, the election. The election hadn't happened yet. Okay, sorry. So this is before the most recent election, which probably you have heard about is like, um, has created the most diverse Congress we've ever seen. So Congress, the federal entity that decides laws and policies on, an, on a national level for all states. We have seen this uptick in women in, in Congress since dating back to 47. We've seen this uptick in, in women members of Congress. We've also seen an uptick in uh, people of color, although, um, it, as you'll see, yes, Congress still is predominantly white, but if you can see the percentage is decreasing. So the percentage of people who are white in Congress is decreasing, meaning the percentage of people of color is increasing, similarly with the U.S. population. So change is not linear. Change takes a really long time. Um, change is absolutely happening. And again, if we could add in just that last election, these statistics would, would change quite a bit two whoops it disappeared okay we're still recording okay i don't know what that was um hopefully it'll be okay <laughs> so yes progress not linear <laughs> we can look at things like this too let me move myself a little more how about i go up here um so we can look at things like this too we can look at um milestones in terms of uh, ability to attain a certain profession, ability to go to college, uh, ability to run and, and be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. 
we are seeing changes, we are seeing progress in all of these things. And if I had the statistics on on the race breakout, I would show you that too, might not be as optimistic. But again, we are seeing those changes, we are seeing when we zoom out and get out of the time frame of like, let me look around this room and see that it's only white CEOs here. Um, when we zoom out, we can see that um, things today are better than they were five years ago, are better than they were 10 years ago, are better than they were 20 years ago. Again, very similar to our lives if we, if we think about the stuff that we've been through to get where we are now too. This was like one of the only options I could find, unfortunately, surveys, my goodness. Um, I put three, four years into a PhD program in, in sociology only to realize that I don't trust surveys at all. Um, I, I like them. I, I think that they have value and, and are important, certainly, but there are, my goodness, so many flaws. So uh, this is a Gallup survey, which is very imperfect and um, not super representative, but this was one of the best options I could find in terms of how to visualize the public perception of how people of color are treated. So here's a, a breakdown. The darkest green is like just the national rate. And then you can see that there's different race breakdowns too. Um, and what we can see is like, yeah, things have fluctuated. They haven't always been even. 2007 was like kind of a bummer year. Uh, a lot of whites were really satisfied with the way black people were being treated. And that was like the all time low for black people themselves to talk about how they were treated, at least the ones who were surveyed for this particular poll. Um, then we missed data for a couple of years, kind of hard to tell what happened in there. But if we can flip towards the end and see the rates in 2015, um, this matches certainly what I am seeing happen on a, on a national trend level too, in that there is so much more awareness now. And there's a lot of reasons for that level of awareness. There's been this increase in conversations about the system of mass incarceration. There's been... Um, <clears throat> All these people, all these public figures speaking out about this issue. I think my computer is dying. Is that the problem? It's plugged in. Okay, I think it should be fine. Um, so, yes, there's there's politicians and and celebrities and people, sports people are are speaking out about this issue. Um, no longer is it possible for at, at least in a city like Omaha, for example, I can't speak to some of the more rural areas that um, where things just trickle in slower, right? Like even in the Midwest and Nebraska, we can feel that like things trickle in slower. They start on the coast and then slowly move towards the middle of the country. So rural communities are a little bit different. Things things travel a bit slower just because there's not this constant influx of people in, people out, etc. But in Omaha, anyways, the way that our young people are growing up, totally different from how even I grew up. And I'm not that old. Um, I mean, it's been a while since I was in high school, for sure. But it, it wasn't that old. It, it hasn't been that many years in the grander scheme of things. And I was able to go through high school without really hearing much about racism. Um, I went to Westside, which is pretty predominantly white. and um, wealthier so we just didn't have to deal with or think about poverty as much um i wasn't wealthy but the community itself and the school certainly was um kids today don't have that experience black lives matter has changed things um the internet has changed things social media has changed things kids today are being raised with a level of awareness that we've never seen before and therefore slowly we're, we're seeing this trickle effect of um awareness right like we we don't know what we don't know so if i grow up in a bubble and i have never known somebody who has experienced racism my perspective on whether racism is real is going to be skewed by my social environment versus now um 
with social media, with Instagram, with Twitter, we can't get away from it. It it would be really, really, really difficult for a young person to go through even elementary school and not be having these conversations just because of where we're at as a society now. And what that does is it creates more awareness. And when we understand things, we are more accepting of them. Um, so it changes. It changes the way we feel. It changes the way society in 2015 now feels uh, in terms of how Black people are treated. We have more awareness, more understanding than we did at the beginning of 2000. Okay. You are probably getting the point. Here's a few more figures if you're not convinced yet. So this is talking about same-sex marriage. Um, obviously, that is now legal. And again, we have seen this widespread push to um, I, just the image of the, the shirt. I don't know if you've seen it necessarily, but there's a shirt that says legalize gay that people wear sometimes. So uh, it's it's it was sort of like a push for legalizing gay marriage, but it was more a commentary or also a commentary on um, acceptance, like like legalize gay as a behavior, legalize gay as a lifestyle, like let's stop discriminating against people because of sexual orientation. So we're seeing that change drastically. Even the middle chart and then the, the last chart on this slide looks at uh, the age breakdown. So even <coughs> Even folks in the older generations, <coughs> we're seeing almost as much shift in their perspectives as we are for millennials. So um, we have come a, a great way in, in 10 years in terms of perspective on gay marriage. And that's something that I've lived through myself and many of you probably have as well. Again, I don't know that I knew any, did I? Not like, not in terms of, of friendships like I probably knew of people there I disappeared again <laughs> um, I probably knew of people but not in terms of, of friendships that I have connections to LGBTQ people through high school again now I don't think that's possible I'm not in high school anymore but I um, work with young people a lot and I, I don't think it's possible to go through high school anymore and and not know somebody who is LGBTQ same thing we're seeing across religious groups Again, different religious groups have different perspectives on same-sex marriage, but we are seeing the same trend. If we zoom out, we are seeing the same trend. We are seeing progress. 2017 was, in fact, called the Year of the Trans Candidate. Um, the Victory Fund is an organization that helps fund LGBT, openly LGBTQ people who want to enter the realm of politics. I actually went through a training with a friend of mine who is currently running for a uh, um, political position in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, so things like the Victory Fund are making politics more accessible to people who otherwise would have never had that option. And again, we are seeing this increase in social understanding. 10 years ago, I guess, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, timelines are difficult to think of sometimes, but uh, 15 years ago, the amount of trans people that we saw, very, very few. Um, people were hiding people were in hiding now we have laverne cox now we have all these other celebrities who openly talk about their experience um <clears throat> and we are seeing this uptick in in lgbtq and, and trans folks especially being open to well being open in their identity as they enter the realm of politics and that in turn changes the way that we all feel we can't, again, now I can't grow up, I can't exist in society and not know that, that trans people exist. I can't do that anymore. And so maybe it takes me a while to come to terms with that. Um, but again, progress is not linear and you can't stop progress. <laughs> so I would end with uh, this image here. Don't miss the forest for the trees. I really like this. Oh, goodness trying to move all these things. I really like this image. I use this a lot. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Um, I think it's a, it's a solid analogy. And also, I love trees, obviously. So I have another tree analogy I'll use in a bit too. But um, if we think about this in terms of our daily lives, we get stuck in the trees all the time. So being stuck in the trees looks like waking up, going to work, doing the same grind, stressing about clients, stressing about coworkers, stressing about paperwork, stressing about homework, um, 
if that is all we're focused on, then we are not seeing the forest, right? Like we are constantly distracted by just the trees in our pathway, this tree that is in front of me um, that I have to deal with today. If we can pause, and and of course it's not always possible to not pay attention to the trees, like we we have to look at where we're walking, right? Like we have to know where we are in proximity to other trees. Um, we don't want to get hit in the face with branches. <laughs> But if we can also take a pause and step back and and zoom out, that can help change our perspective of how helpless we actually are. So when we are in moments when we are just surrounded by the trees and that's all we see and we can't see the sky and we can't see our way out and we don't understand what's happening, we don't even know that we're in a forest necessarily. Um, taking that time to pause, to zoom out, to recognize there's a bigger picture pattern happen happening here. Progress is not linear. While things don't feel good right now, that doesn't mean that they're not getting better. Um, of course, we are not satisfied with where we're at. Of course, I have to deal with these trees that are right in front of me. And also at the same time, I can help maintain my sense of hope and optimism. Um, and really, I think it comes to sustainability. In, in macro work, it's, it's hard to be sustainable because the change can happen really slowly, but that's true with all kinds of work too. Um, taking a forest look, taking a bird's eye view is how we can keep this work sustainable, is how we can keep our macro perspective sustainable, is how we can prevent ourselves from um, getting overwhelmed and overloaded to the point where we feel helpless. Okay, redefining helping people. Next thing I wanna talk about. So let me move myself again. Uh, there's a few images up on the screen to so take a look and think to yourself, what is the intent here? What do you think the person who created this image is intending the message to be? And what do you think the impact is? How do you actually feel receiving the message? How might others feel receiving the message? <clears throat> so I don't know if you're familiar with this term, uh, inspiration porn. Perhaps you are, perhaps you're not. It's a uh, commonly discussed thing in the disabilities community. So inspiration porn is what we are looking at here, really with all of this, although autism speaks is kind of like a whole different thing too. Um, when we prop people with disabilities up as like, wow, look at this person, despite this awful thing that happened to them, they're still able to do all the things that a normal person can do. Even though this person here doesn't have um, one leg, he was still able to, whatever, like get his body looking like it does now. So um, if he can do it, surely you can. So that's inspiration porn. That's, that's objectifying somebody that's using one part of their identity to... Um, motivate you but in a yucky way right it's it's in a yucky way um if we only think of people with disabilities as their disability then this is this is what we get we get this world of hyper focusing on the things that we think that they should be able to do instead of um recognizing and appreciating difference. So if I switch to this slide, let's see how this feels differently. So now what is the impact? And I'm gonna read a couple of these quotes from Stella Young. So this top one, she says, disability doesn't make you exceptional, but questioning what you think you know about it does. She also says the quote, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. The reason that's bullshit is no amount of smiling at a flight of stairs has ever made it turn into a ramp. No amount of standing in the middle of a bookshelf and radiating a positive energy is going to turn all those books into braille. So um, disability is a really great example. Even when we think about social constructs, the way that we have been taught to think of people with disabilities, super yucky, super problematic. Um, there's actually a really fantastic TED talk that I show in some of my classes too. It's by Judith Human, and her, I love that her last name is Human. Um, 
I believe it's spelled H-E-U-M-A-N-N. So she does a TED talk on her experience in education. She's a woman who uses a wheelchair and um, she entered education, the field of education. She's a teacher. She entered that field before people with wheelchairs really were allowed to. Um, and she she also grew up in the time when people with disabilities were segregated, which is still happening now, right? Like think of think back to your high school experience. Um, where do the kids with disabilities go? Were they in classes with you? They weren't for me. They were in they were in isolation. They were in segregation. Um, so in her time, in Judah's time growing up, that was even more prominent. She didn't have any kind of mental impairment. She didn't have a cognitive impairment. Um, she used a, a wheelchair, yet that was equated somehow to her intellect. And and therefore she she faced a lot of challenges and even getting an education. Um, so that's a that's a fantastic video to watch if you are curious to learn more. What this is pointing out for us is that the disability is not the problem. A person who does not have a leg, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. There are ways that that person is, can still very easily do the things that they need to do. The problem is the society that we've established has made it really difficult for people who have really any kind of impairment to exist. Um, so people who have learning disabilities, really hard to go to school in the way that we structure our school environments where like you sit and you listen and you take notes and I will tell you what the answers are and you memorize them. <laughs> um, that's like a bad education model for all of us, really, but especially for people, again, the society that we've created makes it especially difficult for people who have some sort of learning disability or cognitive impairment or attention deficit disorder or whatever. Similarly, with physical ability, being in a wheelchair is not a bad thing. Being a wheelchair user, not a bad thing. Um, being somebody who needs some sort of device to exist in the world, not a bad thing. Disability is not the problem. We know this with glasses, right? Like people who use glasses, that's a, that's a disability, like that's an impairment. We don't treat them differently because of it, though, because society has allowed a way for those people to exist. We haven't done the same thing with mobility. We haven't done the same thing with mobility. Um, even on UNO's campus, my gosh, the CPAC building that the social work department is in, brand new building, like we just built that. And do you know where the elevator is? <laughs> um, if you don't, it is in the very back corner of the building. So anybody who uses a wheelchair, if they need to get from one level to the next, they have to go all the way down and across to the tiny little corner of the building, take the elevator, and then again, move all the way across to wherever they were trying to go. So to visit the social work department for a person who needs to use the elevator, not easy. The disability is not the problem, society is the problem. Same thing with autism. Um, having autism is not a bad thing. Uh, people who have autism can live perfectly happy lives. Too often what we're doing is we are equating normal, like what we believe is normal, we are equating that with like health. And so we think that somebody is not healthy or somebody is not um, capable if they are not what we consider to be normal. People with autism bring gifts into this world that people who don't have autism can't <laughs> or just don't because we don't have to think about it. So when we are thinking of disability, again, I would just really encourage you because all of us have been raised to view disability as like, oh, that poor person, um, how sad. In reality, they're not the problem. Society is the problem. Our views are the problem. So, okay, <laughs> so to think about how this relates to helping people, if we go into a situation thinking that that person is the problem, thinking that I need to change you so you fit better into society, we are perpetuating the problem. We are perpetuating the oppression that that person is going to experience. Disability is a fantastic example of that. All right, how about this? <laughs> what is the intent? What is the impact?
So the gender ones probably resonate. I'm not going to talk about those. Being a gentleman, being a lady. Oh my gosh. Um, I have to read. There's one part in this, but I, yeah. Uh, chew like you have a secret. <laughs> ladies chew like you have a secret that's the rule to always being a lady so if you're eating you better you better watch out how you're eating um, obviously the gender ones are, are problematic i probably don't need to explain those to you but let's talk about some of the other ones so dress how you want to be addressed what are we saying This is a hard one. And, and we do this a lot as an educational institution too. We make y'all dress up for things. We, we as teachers dress up, like I'm wearing a t-shirt now and that's kind of unusual. Um, <clears throat> again, when we are teaching people, you have to look a certain way in order to get dignity and worth as a human. You have to be normal. You have to be what I expect you to be when we are at the point of like that's going to impact how the world interacts with you we have a problem we have a problem um we are not cookie cutter people humans are not cookie cutter right like you are not a cookie cutter person i'm not a cookie cutter person none of us are when we try and put ourselves in these boxes of like here's what a man is here's what a woman is here's what a professional man is here's what a professional woman is so everybody had better figure out you better figure out how to be these two things you better figure out how to fit into those categories when we are teaching people to do that we are teaching them to to suffocate themselves we are teaching them that there's something wrong with the way that they are um, and we are teaching them that social norms are more important than human experience um, Tattoos are a really good example for this. 10 years ago, I did I have tattoos 10 years ago? I may have had one or two, um, but they weren't in visible places. Now I have this sucker that you can't get away from. So um, 10 years ago, I would have been way too terrified. I was way too terrified to get a tattoo in a visible place. In fact, I, I got this was my first most visible tattoo. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little hard. Um, and I strategically got it here so I could cover it up with bracelets if I needed to or bracelets if I needed to. Um, because I listened to what people told me about tattoos. They're unprofessional. In the real world, you'll never get a job if you have a visible tattoo. Um, people equate that with bad, bad, bad things. People aren't going to take you seriously. So I listened to that. Now we can see that society is very different. When we're teaching people how to fit with what is decided to be a social norm, we are taking away their authenticity and we're also preparing them for a future that we can't guarantee. Um, the people who told me about tattoos were wrong. I've been fine with the tattoo that I got. Um, maybe 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been, but they didn't know what the future was going to look like and they still were trying to fit me into that future. And they were wrong. The future now, we can have purple hair and, and work for different organizations. Like I have part of a shaved head and I have not been fired yet. Um, so yes, thinking about why am I pushing this expectation? Why am I pushing this cultural norm onto this person? Same thing with some days you have to put it on a brave face and soldier on. We tell that to ourselves all the time suck it up, deal with it, especially in school. Suck it up, deal with it. You got to figure it out. Um, you have to figure it out. Okay, yes. And also at what cost? Um, also at what cost? Because what are we teaching people to do there? Again, we're teaching people that their achievement is more important than their human needs. Um, and this speaks to the stigma against mental health. The fact that um, we can't, or currently, I think we're moving in the direction of being able to, but currently there's still stigma attached. If I were to email my boss and say, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with anxiety. I'm really struggling with my depression today. I can't, I just need to stay home and stay in bed. Um, we don't view that the same way as if I told you, I have a cold, I have to stay home and stay in bed. Socially acceptable, totally fine. Mental health stuff, not quite the same. Um, so again, what we're teaching people is to oppress themselves, to not listen to themselves, to fit into this arbitrary rule that we've decided. Here's what society looks like. You better always prioritize your job above your health, above yourself. Um, we have to stop perpetuating that. We have to stop perpetuating that. Um, at a certain point, we just, we have to start living in the kind of world we want to live in. And I don't know that any of us want to live in, in, in this world. 
Do you? I don't know. I don't. Okay. The problem with video recordings is I get on a platform and then I have a lot to say. So we're, we're almost through the impact versus intent part of this. Uh, so this one. Okay. I can't really see that. Ooh. It's totally disappeared. Here. <clears throat> All right. Last example to think about redefining helping people. Oh, wait. So this goes with this slide. So this slide is what's the intent? What's the impact? How are these things? While we may have good intentions when I'm telling you like, hey, don't dye your hair blue, I might be having a good intention, um, but I'm also projecting a vision onto you that may or may not fit who you actually are. I'm trying to make you more like me. Um, and if we zoom out, if we think about this from a macro perspective, that doesn't help anybody. It keeps us stuck. If instead we think about this, we think about the concept of authenticity. We think about the concept of being unapologetically ourselves, being unapologetically black, being unapologetically queer, being unapologetically whatever. We think about speaking truth to bullshit. If you're not familiar with Brene Brown, you, you should be. Um, although you're in Christina's class, so probably you are. This is Jacob Tobiah again, who was in that picture earlier. And um, I mentioned they are involved with fashion. And this was an article that came out last year that is talking about um, the, the fashion world's embracing of gender fluidity. So when we talked about gender as being compared to, to colors where we can we can think beyond the, the labels of man and woman and accept just people for being people, however they want to be people. Um, this article talks about how not only is that good for people, it's also good for business. <laughs> it's also good for business. So for capitalism, every social leap forward is a marketing opportunity. Um, kind of sucks to, to think about it in terms of dollars and cents, but if the heart aspect is not compelling enough, then, then maybe this will be. So this is a quote from Jacob. Um, they said, people are always surprised when I tell them, but as a trans femme, non-binary person, what we face is drastic. So not long ago, they listened in horror on a subway car as two strangers loudly discussed whether to set them aflame. Um, this is the type of world we get when we force people to fit into boxes. So when we think we are helping someone, we need to take a step back. We need to consider, are we actually helping them? What is our intention? We want to help them, yes. What is our intention? But what is the impact? Are we actually helping them? Or are we creating a world in which it is acceptable for people to have a public conversation about burning someone on the subway? All right. I feel like we're getting the point, so let's skim through these. Okay, finally, third item, ask the tough questions. So this is going to touch on, on some of the pieces we've talked about already. <laughs> Let me move myself back over a little bit. So first, what is helping? <laughs> when we think about what does helping people mean, when we think about what is our impact versus what is our intent, we need to think about how we are helping and how we are hurting. And we need to think about this in both the short run and the long run. I might be helping you for, I might be helping you in the short run if I tell you, hey, don't dye your hair blue. Maybe that means you'll be able to get a job easier, faster, or something. Um, although I think that's questionable. But maybe I'm helping you in the short run. But when I'm telling you don't dye your hair blue, I'm also telling you that who you are is not okay and that you need to try harder to be someone else. You need to try harder to fit into a social norm that I can't guarantee is going to be around for the next five years. So I might feel like I'm helping in the long run. I'm probably hurting more than I'm helping. Also thinking of 
Um, are we speaking to under to be understood before we seek to understand? So this is okay. Let me back up for just a second because this is from a clip here. So this is this quote: "Seek first to understand, then to be understood." So probably you've heard that before. That goes along with the whole: um, Are we listening just to figure out what we're going to say after the person person finishes talking, or are we listening because we are genuinely trying to understand? A lot of times we are listening and we're waiting for them to finish. Um, we want them to understand what we want for them. We want them to understand, here's what I believe is the best thing for you. Why do we want that? And what are we saying when we hold that perspective? What I think we're saying is, I know more than you about what's best for you. And we have this conversation in some ways. We have this conversation in some ways. Um, but far too often, we still find ourselves falling into the same pattern of, am I saying that my vision for your success is more important for you than your own vision for success? So we need to be really careful. <clears throat> Similarly, whoop, here's a mug again. <laughs> Similarly, what are we teaching people? Very often in this society, we are regulating, we are othering difference. If we are teaching people to change something about their ability status, their gender norm, their appearance, the way they talk, their class, whether they've gone to school, their hobbies, their interests, etc. If we are teaching people, if, if our message is trying to change something about them, we need to ask ourselves this critical question. Are we helping or are we hurting? And even if we feel like we're helping, how might we be hurting? How might we be teaching somebody, you should be more like me? I like this mug a lot. No wrong way to be human. Whoa, that is not what I meant to do. Okay. Uh, we also need to think, why are we doing things the way that we're doing them? So this goes along with what, I've, what a lot of what I've talked about already in terms of identity, but this is something that we see play out uh, in the nonprofit world all the time, right? Like, we've always done it this way, and this is just the way we do it. We've had this policy for years. This is our mission. If we don't ask ourselves those critical questions of why, all we're doing is replicating the system we have in place. Um, something I say all the time is, if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll keep getting what we've got. And a macro perspective calls on us to consider, do we want to keep getting what we've got? Are we happy with the society we've created? Do we want to continue promoting a society where what we wear is more important, how we look is more important than what we are actually saying? Where, more, where the money that we have is more important than what we're actually saying, than actually the, the content that we're sharing with the world. Um, yeah. Is that what we want? <laughs> because if it's not what we want, then we have to do something different. We have to do something different. Change doesn't happen by itself. <clears throat> uh, so I am really interested in the, in the intersections of uh, clinical work and macro work. I think there's a lot of overlap. Probably you're getting that from this talk already, just because a, a lot of the things that I'm talking about are um, things that you probably think about in a macro or in a micro perspective all the time. So DBT, great therapeutic practice. Um, I like a lot of things about DBT and prefer it a little bit more to, to CBT. So um, sorry if you're a CBT person, but I I have seen DBT work well in areas where CBT hasn't. Um, but that's largely with uh, like complex trauma healing. So I think we all have complex trauma to heal from, just this nature of growing up in this world <clears throat> at this particular point in time. So this is a worksheet from uh, DBT Therapeutic Practices that is about obviously the pros and cons of acting on crisis urges. So traditionally this worksheet is used probably in like a safety contract kind of way for somebody who is having suicidal ideation or self-harm ideation as a way of slowing down the decision-making process so somebody can weigh the pros and cons and think about 
Okay, why do I want to act on this urge? Why do I want to? What are the reasons that, I, that I'm feeling drawn towards doing this? What are the things that are preventing me from doing it? And then on the flip side, what are the pros and cons to me choosing not to do that thing that I have the urge to do? What good would come of that? What bad would come of that? It's a way of, of yeah, encouraging critical thought, right? It's a way of getting us to, to think critically instead of making a snap judgment decision. It gets us to slow the process down and maybe we still do the thing. However, thinking about it, thinking about it in this kind of manner is, again, the only way that change happens. Um, maybe we have to think, th think it through time and time and time again, and then eventually we decide to do something different. We realize the cons are outweighing the pros at that point in time. So what I propose is that we can use this from a macro perspective too. Um, and in fact, in the, the social welfare planning for social change class, used to be social welfare planning, uh, planning for social change class, I have my students do this. <laughs> so it's all about thinking about different potential solutions to bigger picture social problems. And let's think about what's working about the way we're doing it now, what's not. If we have an idea that scares us, that we think like, oh my gosh, I don't know if that can be possible, that seems like too much change, probably people wouldn't understand, wouldn't accept it, I don't know, we're not ready. What are the pros and cons of that idea? Cons might be like, we don't have the infrastructure or like the public isn't going to understand or um, it's risky. We might lose money. We might lose staff. We might lose something. But what are the pros? If we put this much thought into why we are taking the actions that we're taking now as a social work profession in our nonprofit realms in really all capacities, um, yeah, I think we would be handling a lot of social problems very differently than we currently are. Um, a little bit, I think this is like a call to return to critical thinking. <laughs> Let's stop doing things the way that we've always done them. Because again, if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll keep getting what we've got. And it seems to me that we're at the point in history where we're all ready for something new. We're kind of recognizing like, oh, this isn't what any of us want. Um, so if it's not what we want, let's do something different. Let's take a risk. Okay, final thing, asking the tough questions. Um, this is like something I really like. So uh, thinking about when we're thinking about a problem, when we're thinking about something that we want to help someone with on an individual level, or when we're thinking about a bigger picture social problem that we want to address, really important for us to again think critically and differentiate the symptoms from the problems so what are the problem symptoms or the symptoms from the roots <laughs> well yeah sort of the symptoms from the problems but what are the problem symptoms versus what are the problems roots what tells us there is a problem versus what is holding that problem up so a tree analogy here's this other tree analogy i promised you um, I like to conceptualize this as, as a tree. So a tree grows in the ground. A tree starts as a seed, starts as a seed under the earth and develops roots, develops, you know, some, some basic internal structure. And as it develops those roots, as it develops its capacity to, um, to really like continue the growth process, then it starts to emerge from the ground. The <laughs> then it starts to emerge from the ground so the top of the tree the tree well what we call the tree itself the top of the tree is what's most visible to us the trunk the branches when we think of tree that's what we think of that's not what came first the trunk and the branches came out of the roots the roots is where the tree started the roots are where the tree started and then it grew up and we were able to see this beautiful flourishing thing that emerged from the earth Similarly, social problems don't just appear. <laughs> a tree doesn't just appear. Social problems don't just appear. Um, the things that we look around in society and think, wow, this is so terrible. How did it get to be this way? Those very often are symptoms of something happening under the surface. They're symptoms that have emerged as a result of roots that were underground for who knows how long, sometimes hundreds of years, sometimes longer. <laughs> So if we think about what are the problem's symptoms versus what are the problem's roots, 
that is also a way of helping ourselves um, sort of reframe what is helping versus what is hurting. Are we just addressing a symptom? Am I trying to like pull leaves off of a tree? When in reality, there's like some roots that need some work? Or am I actually getting at uh, something that would change the structure of the tree in order to, um, yeah, morph it into whatever it is that I, that I want it to look like instead? So a few examples of this. <clears throat> On a micro level, let's think about this. Let's think about, we imagine we have a 22-year-old client. This client has criminal history. This client has been seeking employment for seven months. So for seven months, this person has been unable to find employment. So what's the symptom? What's the cause? Think about it yourself first, and I'll tell you what I think. <clears throat> okay, so when we think about someone not being able to find a job, Yes, not being able to find a job leads to some other potential negative outcomes, like not having money, not being able to eat, not being able to have health care, etc. But where does that come from? When we think about this example, the fact that people with criminal histories have a hard time finding employment, that's our root. That's our root. This 22-year-old client who can't find a job, the fact that they can't find employment is a symptom of a deeper problem. And maybe it's just the criminal history. Maybe race is coming into play. Maybe age is coming into play. Maybe social environment is coming into play. There could be a lot of other things, but the fact that this person can't find a job is a symptom. That is not a cause in and of itself. So if we address this problem by putting this person in an employment training program, Okay, maybe they'll be able to get a job after that. However, we've done nothing to change the route. So the next time another client, another 22-year-old client with criminal history walks in the door, we're going to have to deal with the same branch. So if I am funneling my efforts to help this population into developing job training programs to help people get jobs, I might be helping an individual, but I'm also maintaining the system of the tree. I'm also like supporting a branch essentially to try and get to a social problem instead of addressing what's going on underneath. And again, if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll keep getting what we've got. So if we keep addressing employment issues by putting individuals, taking a micro approach and putting an individual person through a training program to then find a job, all we're doing is reinforcing the system and a broken system because we have a system that has symptoms like this. Okay, next example. 19-year-old ages out of foster care and moves in with an emotionally abusive partner. Symptom or root cause? So hopefully this one you can conceptualize. So um, why might a 19-year-old who aged out of the foster care system accept a relationship like this? Again, we could take an individual approach and just like tell this person, no, you can't live with them. They're abusive. You need to move out. You need to go somewhere else. We can forcibly move, remove them from the situation. Um, if we do that, do you think the problem goes away? Will that 19-year-old then only have healthy relationships from then on out for the rest of their life? No. Um, we need to get at a deeper root of the problem. So the foster care system, super unstable place to grow up. Um, for a person to age out of the foster care system means that they've never found permanency within the foster care system, which means that they might not even have like one person who's been a stable figure throughout their life. Um, oftentimes that's what that means. So the problem we're talking about here is that we have this system where children are able to grow up and, and not learn what love looks like, not learn what a relationship is supposed to be, is supposed to feel like, what unconditional love feels like. Um, that's the root of the problem. And we could like continue digging down to find even more roots that are connected because that's the thing about the roots is much like in this image, they're, they're 
they're messy. They're they're big. They're massive. In fact, in this image, the roots are more expansive than the branches of the tree. So they're all interconnected. They're all deeply complicated. But unless we're going underneath the surface and, and tapping stuff underneath the surface, all we're doing is like trimming a leaf off a tree. And if we trim a leaf off a tree, the leaf grows right back, right? Okay, on a macro level, I think this is macro. On a macro level, U.S. incarceration. U.S. incarcerates people at a higher rate than any other country. Symptom or cause? I would argue symptom. Um, and I've touched on this already. So the the system of mass incarceration did not happen accidentally. The system of mass incarceration was a response to ending segregation and um, a continued effort to exert power and control over largely people of color. So the fact that we have the incarceration system we do is a symptom of a deeper problem. Until we start digging into that deeper problem, we will continue to do what we have. Another example, the rate of children in foster care has increased every year since 2012. So you're probably getting the point now. If we think about why is this happening, we can come up with a whole bunch of answers. Poverty rates, access to health care, discrimination, oppression, generational stuff, generational cycles of abuse, my goodness. Um, the fact that children of color are disproportionately represented in the foster care system is a huge indicator that this is a symptom and not a cause because there has to be a reason for that unless we believe that people of color are somehow more violent or abusive, which I hope none of us believe. Um, then there is some other underlining cause as to why we're seeing the symptom that we are. And until we break that down and start thinking about it, we can't do anything to solve it. Um, yeah, this is an exercise that I do a, a lot in my classes. There's also, if you are interested, um, at the end of the slide, I have like a, or at the end of this, whatever presentation thing, um, I have some information that I'll share that I've been working on, but I also uh, recently started creating like mini zines. So this is a mini zine. It's very cute. Um, but this one is about colonization, the impacts of colonization. And on the back specifically, I'll hold it up. Maybe you can see. Um, I detail this a little bit. So I talk about, hey, here's a tree. Here's symptoms. Here's causes. Here's an example of how things like uh, our country's poor physical health rates or high rates of mental illness our high healthcare costs, costs, those are symptoms that branched out of discrimination and oppression, all the isms right here, and ultimately have deeper roots in uh, colonization, colonialism. Um, the way that our country was founded is, is the reason that we are seeing a lot of the social problems that we are. So again, if we don't take the time to dig into those roots and think about which of these things needs to be changed, which of these things is not working, which of these things is resulting in branches and leaves that we don't want on our tree, um, we will continue to have this. We will continue to have the problems that we see. So anyways, I bring that up because if you are interested, my contact information will be at the end of this and I would be glad to, um, to share some of this with y'all. So if you want a mini zine, <laughs> I can make that happen. Okay, I've kind of talked about this already. Um, roots are multi-dimensional. They're all interconnected. It's a system. None of this is simple. It requires critical thought. It requires a lot of critical thinking and a lot of questioning of what we think we believe. All right, so I'm going to end with some inspirational quotes from people who I deem revolutionary, um, just in case you're not convinced by the words I said alone. Uh, these are quotes that, that really resonated and spoke to me in terms of um, how do we start to change these systems? So I've talked about those three steps in terms of like liberating your worldview. Let me pull them back up. Liberating your worldview, redefining helping people, asking the tough questions. All of these are centered on us. 
right? Like all of the steps that I've talked about to adopting a macro perspective have to do with unlearning and relearning and um, waking up in a way, like waking up, um, sort of like white people realizing that racism is a thing or white people realizing that white privilege is a thing. It's like, it causes this like aha moment. We don't know what we don't know until we know it. Um, same with this stuff. So if we look back on these quotes from these folks that I would deem revolutionary, we can see echoes of what I've talked about. We can see that they too have come to the realization of the change has to happen with from within. We have to change ourselves in order to change the world because that's the only way change happens. That's the only way change happens. So here's Carl Jung, the person who looks outward dreams, the person who looks inward awakens. Oh, uh, here's Grace Lee Boggs. She's fantastic. Um, let me move myself so you can see. So she has this documentary, American Revolutionary, which is still free on Netflix, I believe. Well, you have to have a Netflix subscription, but it's on Netflix. Um, so it's a documentary about her. She's a Chinese American who was deeply involved with the Black Panther movement uh, and then got involved. In, I mean, she's with the labor movement as well and, and got involved with a whole bunch of other liberationary efforts. Um, but she yeah she's she's very wise uh she's she's deceased now she lived to be 100 and then she just recently passed away um but living to 100 was her goal so i think that's that's really special so here's a couple of quotes that i like from her specifically i just love we are the leaders we've been looking for we are the people we've been waiting for if we are waiting for someone else to save us it's not going to happen because we are the humans on this planet at this time and we have to create the world that we want to see Nobody else is going to do it for us. We're all there is. So she says, to make a revolution, people must not only struggle ex against existing institutions, they must make a philosophical, spiritual leap to become more human human beings. In order to change and transform the world, they must change and transform themselves. <clears throat> Einstein. Um, Einstein, such an interesting person to me. I knew, obviously, like, he was a genius or whatever. Um, but until I started thinking about all this macro social work stuff, I didn't realize, like, what that meant exactly. So we know him for math and science, um, but he's very much a revolutionary thinker as well. So he's got all these quotes that I just love. Um, Education is not the learning of facts, but training the mind to think. So there's that theme of um, we need to move away from categories, from definitions, from getting lost in the way that things are. We need to get away from like, here's what society is. Let me teach you how to exist in this society. And we instead need to critically think and envision together the kind of world that we want to live in. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. It's very similar to, I think, an Audre Lorde quote about um, the master's tools will never be what we, ah, will never dismantle, we can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. It's something like that. Um, it sounds better than what I just said, but it speaks to the same idea here. If we are stuck in the same way of thinking, if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll keep getting what we've got. And again, are we satisfied with what we've got? He also says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. So this I love. Um, a big effort of, of what I do in the Planning for Social Change class is um, we work really hard to stop jumping to solutions. When we're jumping to solutions, usually we're projecting our view of what needs to happen onto somebody else. And if we're not thinking from that more expansive point of view, then again, all we're doing is replicating the current system we have. So direct from Einstein himself, um, if we spend more time critical thinking, then the answers will come to us. The answers themselves, the ways out of the society that we've created, um, not that difficult to conceptualize. They really aren't. The difficult thing to do is to learn how to deconstruct the way that we've been programmed to view social problems. Angela Davis, fantastic as well. We have to talk about liberating minds as well as liberating society. The two cannot, you can't have one without the other. Um, change won't happen unless we change the way that we think and we feel. And again, if this is hard for you to think about, think about it on a micro level. 
Think about your own life. Think about changes that you've made. Think about transformations you've had personally, periods of growth that you've experienced, improvements and changes you've made in your life. What changed first? Did you just wake up and start doing the thing? Or did you have to go through some sort of transformational emotional experience or intellectual experience? Did you have to practice and learn how to think about the situation differently in order to change your behavior? I would say probably you did. Um, same thing with society. We can't change society if we haven't changed the way that we are viewing society. And radical simply means grasping things at the root. Um, I don't know if you knew that, but yeah, the definition of, of radical is literally like to the root, at the root, changing the root. Um, so when we talk about the change we want to see, if we want radical change, we have to take the time to think about where is this rooted? Where is this problem rooted? How do we address the root? Because if we don't address the root, the problem's not going to stop. It'll just look different than it did before. We might end slavery, but then we'll have segregation. We might end segregation, but then we're going to have criminal justice. We have to think about things deeper. Teet Nhat Hanh, such, such wonderful messages here too. Uh, peace in oneself, peace in the world, and we have peace inside. That's how we get peace without, outside of ourselves. When we see the nature of inner being, barriers between ourselves and others are dissolved, and peace, love, and understanding are possible. So when we recognize that we don't need other people to be like us or to be what we view as normal or good or healthy, um, that's unconditional love. That's unconditional love. And also, understanding someone's suffering is the best gift you can give another person. Understanding is love's other name. If you don't understand, you can't love. So again, when we're coming from uh, a paternalistic mindset of I know what's best for you, that's not coming from love. That's not sustainable social change. That's projection. Change ourselves, change the world. Lovely quote from Grace Lee Boggs. Um, so this is, yeah, her final picture too. Oh, it was 2015 that she passed away. Okay. She, yeah, she was, she just recently turned 100. So she says, revolution is evolution towards something much grander. I love that too. I have truly come to believe that um, evolution is what we're experiencing. And this is why progress is not linear. And this is also why progress is inevitable. Because human evolution is inevitable. Um, yeah, it's unstoppable. It's always been unstoppable. And it takes a long time. And there are certainly efforts to stop it. <laughs> People try. Um, the system tries to maintain itself. The system, our systems are really, really, really good at self-survival. If you uh, even think about nonprofits, a lot of times what we find ourselves doing in nonprofits is reinforcing the system of the nonprofit, working to acquire money, funding, um, resources, publicity, approval, working to maintain the inner workings of the nonprofit itself so that nonprofit can survive. Not necessarily bad, but also can mean that we're putting the survival of the nonprofit above anything else. <clears throat> I lost where I was going with that, but <laughs> evolution. Um, so evolution. So yes, human growth as a population, allowing that growth to happen without resisting change. <clears throat> okay, here's the bonus slide, I promise, with my contact information. So this is something I just wanted to share. It's like sort of relevant, but also a little bit random. Oh, I need to move myself more. Here we go. Um, so this is what I believe can be potentially used as a... Uh, template for individual evolution, but also because the micro is the macro and the macro is the micro, can also be used as um, a template for our collective evolution. So it's sort of a play on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it is uh, incorporating some additional theories as well. So on the bottom of this, it says, see second page. You can't see the second page because you don't have the worksheet, but if you want the worksheet, email me. I will gladly send it to you. Happy to share this information. Um, but if you look at like theories of development, if you look at um, even like Eastern methodologies, if you have studied like chakra systems, seven system chakras at all, um, speaks to the same like uh, levels of development, essentially. 
So much like Maslow's, the bottom level, the lower level physiological functioning that speaks to our physiology. Um, too often we, we, with Maslow's anyways, I see us um, assuming that this is just like, we need to have food, we need to have shelter. <laughs> like, yes, those things are important, but our physiological functioning includes a lot more than that. And even Maslow recognized that if you, if you go back and actually read his written work, um, he, he thought of our lower level physiology, this lowest level in this triangle, quite differently than, than oftentimes how we talk about it today. So our physiological functioning includes um, how our body is working. It includes how our mind is working. I also have a, a mini zine that <laughs> talks about, this is about healing, but it um, focuses in on this triangle thing and then like talks about the different levels. Um, so physiological functioning is about our ability to match our, our mind and our body. And that allows us to um, have a sense of calm, have a sense of ease that, uh, that then allows us to move up to the next levels. If we're struggling with anxiety, if we're struggling with depression, if we are overwhelmed by thoughts that are just like, la, 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 keeping us up at night, that was me for most of my life, um, we are unable to focus really on anything else. Super hard to zoom out when we are just wrapped up in, in the trees, right? Like this is a, a lot of like being wrapped up in the trees, only being able to see what's immediately in front of us because um, that's all our, our mind or that's all our, our central nervous system will allow us to focus on. So if we don't address those lower level things, we can't evolve as an individual person. It's gonna affect all of these other aspects of our development. Um, and again, not that this is linear, like we can't, it's not saying that if you experience anxiety or depression, that you're not going to have like a sense of safety and belonging, not saying that it is saying that if there are, if your energy and your attention is being focused on this lowest level down here, then that's less energy and attention that you have to expand upwards. That's less energy and attention that you have for the other levels of this triangle. Um, we can only do so much. We can only focus on so much. So, yes, yeah, if we have gaps, if we have aspects of our physiological functioning that is not um, working efficiently and that is calling our attention constantly because we just can't, our body is, is on edge, our mind is on edge, the chatter in our mind won't stop. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it's really hard to do anything else. <laughs> and I speak that from personal experience as well. So then we move up this ladder. We see that we have a sense of safety, both socially and physically. Then it moves up to sense of love and belonging, self-esteem needs, ultimately spiritual fulfillment. Um, so I'll let you read all of this. And again, if you are interested in more, send me an email, send you what I have. Um, what I would say is, oh, there's that. Um, what I would say is think about where you're at on an individual level. Yes. Also, think about where you think we're at on a society level. Think about where your family is at. How far up this chain, how far up this triangle were your grandparents able to focus? How about your parents? How about you? When I think collectively, um, when I think of my own family, for instance, like my grandparents were, were farmers on both sides, greatly affected by the, the Great Depression. So um, yeah, my grandparents grew up in that age and that absolutely impacted how my parents were raised. So my parents were raised with a heavy focus on like, you need to save money, you need to focus on um, being able to meet your own basic needs because we never know what will happen. People who went through the Great Depression like had that experience of suddenly just everything being being wiped away and um, really having to to struggle to maintain survival, really having to struggle with that lowest level on the triangle, that physiological functioning. If my nutrition is off, if my nutrition is imbalanced, then um, 
my body is not going to be working. I'm going to be in fight or flight mode, worried about when is my next meal coming in. And that's going to prevent me from being able to, to move forward. Like I'm stuck in that trauma. I'm stuck in that um, like scarcity mentality. So I can reflect on, on how that influenced my parents' upbringing. And I can reflect on how that influenced my upbringing, how my parents were didn't have to go through the Great Depression, didn't have to struggle with some of the things that their parents did. Um, my parents were probably able to get to that sense of safety area. They were able to uh, have a sense of like, I'm okay. And I can, if I don't focus on this 24 seven, like the, the sky's not going to fall. And therefore they were able to, to move past the physiological functioning level a bit better than perhaps my grandparents were. So for me being raised, I was again raised with that same sort of mentality of like, you need to save money, you need to worry about security, you need to worry about stability. Um, but again, it was like a little bit further removed. So it was a little bit less intense than the lessons my parents were raised with. So I have been able to move a bit beyond that stage of the, of the triangle. So I've been continually able to um, further my own family evolution by continuing to move further up this triangle as the different generations are able to um, <clears throat> just adjust to living in this world. As the world around us changes, then we change too. As we change, the world around us changes. So think about this in terms of your family and think about it in terms of society. Like what level do you think the United States is at? Do you think that in the United States, we collectively have a sense of safety, both socially and physically? I would say no. Um, I really think we don't. I think as a society in the United States, we are still figuring out this physiological functioning level. We are still stuck down here trying to figure out, like, how do we even help somebody who has depression? Do we tell them to go outside? Go run? Do we tell them to get over it? How do we help people who have depression? Yeah, and a lot of our systems currently are are not so helpful. Um, so when we again zoom out beyond the trees, we can get a feel for where we're at, but then also where we're going. So we can recognize, yes, we are in this physiological functioning level. We are in this lowest level as a collective United States society. That sucks. That's really hard. Um, also, we've come a long way and we're so much closer to this sense of safety, socially and physically level than we ever have been before. And in fact, I would say that the, um, the types of social movements that we're seeing now, we're being pushed to move to this level. Black Lives Matter, the um, LGBTQ equality movement, um, lots of other social movements have focused on raising awareness that I am not safe because of my identity. Because of my identity, society has created an unsafe environment. Society is the problem, not me. Again, we can think about the disability thing here too. Um, we can think about people with disabilities. The fact that they have this disability is not the problem. The fact that we have a society that makes it really difficult for some people to exist and makes it really easy for other people to exist, that's the problem. So we are working collectively to move up this triangle. Um, but in order to do that, we as individuals have to move up the triangle. Otherwise, we don't know. We can't, we can't bring society along with us if we don't know where we're headed. Um, okay, so that was long. That's about two hours of me talking. Um, hopefully it was interesting. I will stop here. Um, but again, yeah, let me know if you want any access to this information. I will send Christina this PowerPoint as well so you can have access. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. And I will probably see you or talk to you at some point in time. Um, have a great day. Enjoy the weather. Bye.